Hey everyone, National Master Sean Lei here. I have some amazing news for next week. And what amazing news that is, is I'm going to be back to streaming on Saturdays from 6.30 to whenever p.m. Eastern Time. So join us if you want to learn some new chess stuff, if you guys have any questions, or you just want to enjoy some nice chess streaming. Alright, let's get into the fun games today. Alright, so a lot of you guys told me you guys really enjoyed some um, my games against some lower rated opponents because I can explain my thinking and everything, so let's just do it again today, I guess. So alright, so this is a Karakon, I like to call this the Trash Con because I really don't like playing against it, I find it very annoying. And I'm going to play a variation somebody actually taught me in one of my other um, videos in which they told me that this variation over here is it's called the Brayer Variation, but it's kind of like the uh, Philidor Defense if you really think about it. Kind of does look like one, because we're just going to play the moves like c3, b5, stuff like that. So I'm going to try this out. Usually I play the fantasy variation against the Karakon, but maybe this is good. One thing I already don't like about this though, is I don't like how this um, c3, b4 isn't as effective anymore, because the knight's not here, a pawn is here instead. Well, we'll see how this translates into an actual game. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. So my opponent's thinking here. Don't know what he's thinking of though. One thing I would like it he would play is maybe he plays e5 and then maybe plays d4, so he creates some weaknesses for me. If not, we're just gonna follow up with the normal Philidor plans. Hmm, he is thinking for quite some time though, that's weird. Don't know why he's thinking for so long on this move. Hopefully he didn't disconnect. So Alright, he played e5, so I play knight of three. It's gonna cackle next move. Maybe play c3 first. Let's play c3 first. Give a little ambiguity. Maybe he'll be surprised which way a castle. <laughs> Alright, so this is called the super defense of e5 strategy over here. We're just gonna pile up a little bit more resources to attack it. Ooh, he plays knight here. Not sure I like that move. Not sure it does much. We're threatening to take here and then take there, so hopefully our opponent sees that. Maybe he'll play bishop g4 to pin me, but then I have h3. See what our opponent does here. Knight doesn't belong here. One thing he could have done was rook e8 to play knight here and knight here. I think that was the strongest place to put the knight. Alright, let's kick it. He has to move. Oh, I guess he can capture, I guess. Um, but I don't think capturing is too good because now I have the bishop here and my bishop is unleashed now. Not too sure that's good because the bishop can go here. Ooh, does he just allow me to take here? I think so. Well, take there and we'll take the e5 pawn. The catapult strategy, as I like to call it. We even have a little skip score for a king if we get back rank checkmated. So yeah, this is pretty good for me. If I get d4, it's even better. Even if I don't get d4, it's good. This d5 pawn's weak, we want a pawn, life is good. So yeah, it is what it is. Pop, 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 pop. See what he does. To be honest, he's probably in shock. He's never seen this before. So though it's a common Philidor strategy, just winning the e5 pawn. Let's play developing moves towards that plan. And a lot of people, they don't expect it. So, there's that. Alright, so he tries to pin me, but the question is, does the pin actually do anything? Can I just play d4? Yep, yeah. I mean, it's not even pinned to begin with, but let's just keep our knight on a good square. Maybe get a bishop d3, start a king side attack over here. Looks pretty solid. Yeah, this move over here. Not sure what I think about it, to be honest. Not sure if it's good, not sure if it's bad. I mean, I'll just take it, I guess. In between move by my opponent. I mean, he has to take back, right? Yep. All right, let's pin him. We have the open foul, that's pretty good. And also he has to be always scared about this pawn over here being lost. We're also pinning his knight over here.
Maybe he plays h6, but then I just move back. That's an interesting move. Um, what do I want to do? Do I want to double up with the queen in front, or do I want to play something like this? Queen d2. Well, let's just play here. Just double up this way. We have an extra pawn, so we're always down to trade pieces. Though I'm not sure I want to trade into an opposite colored bishop ending, because as you guys know, that usually leads to draws, which is not something I'm too fond of here. Though he is really tempting me right now, and I think I'll do it because he doubles the pawns here. And we'll play here to attack every single weakness he has in this position. This is not very comfortable for him, because he can't really defend each one very well. And my rook is coming in to get this um, e-file as well. So, we're just going to slowly outplay him. The reason why I can trade this now is because I need to make sure, because I can make sure I don't trade off queens and rooks. If I can make sure I don't trade this off, then it's actually better for the person with um, opposite colored um, bishops. Because it's easier to attack. Now he's obviously trying to bait me into taking here. Because then bishop check and oh my gosh I lose. But I'll just play g3 for multiple reasons. Getting my bishop out. As well as um, blocking the his blocking of my um, h2 score. And so again slow and steady wins the race. Learn from the turtle. Learn from the turtle indeed. So now I'm actually threatening to take on f6 because bishop takes g3 doesn't do anything. Alright, let's just double up here. Oh, not double up, but let's just get this um, file over here. It's a nice file. See what he plays. He plays b5, protecting his pawn over there. Makes sense. Let's play bishop g2 because the bishop's no longer needed on this diagonal because he defended it. And yeah, let's just attack this rook. We're threatening to win the rook now. He has to do something about that. plays there. I don't want to trade pieces though, which I did mention before. Let's throw in a check, see what he does. Let's throw in a check. Is he going to move the king? What's he going to do? thing is, I might be forced to exchange rooks here, which is not something I want to do. Because again, opposite colored bishops might not be the best for me. Um... I might play rook e3 because I want him to capture me. I don't know if this pawn structure is better, but I know I don't want to capture him because that improves his pawn structure. We are threatening something like bishop here if he captures like that, but I need to make sure my king is safe as well. Not sure if I can guarantee that. It's a hard endgame, for sure. It's definitely a difficult endgame here. But again, as long as we don't rush, we will outplay our opponent eventually. Might play king h2 as a safe move as well. Alright. Again, make sure we don't trade off the queens unless it's a guaranteed win in the endgame. Tax my pawn. Don't want to play g4 because that creates some weaknesses. So let's just play king h2. Need to be scared of him doing some sacrifices, but there doesn't seem to be any right now. We can, um, his queen is stuck defending this pawn. I can move my queen here, which would be quite useful because the queen in the center is very strong. All right, he's attacking the pawn. Let's just go back here. Bring in our pieces to attack his king. Let's do something like this setup. Queen here, bishop here, queen here, attack h7. Something like that looks pretty good. Why? Because these are very big weaknesses in his position. That I can try to exploit. Oh, can we not just play this right now? 
Let's play bishop here, actually. Um, because if I just play here, he can always just go back here, and we just go back and forth. Which is not too good for me. Slowly I'll play our opponent. Target weaknesses all across the board. My position only has g3 really as a big weakness. So as long as I keep this defended, I'll be fine. Now you might be asking why didn't I play g4? Well, because then he can invade my position. I don't want that to happen. Because if he can invade my position, the easier it is for him to attack my king. All right. All right, we can play bishop here, threatening a checkmate. So he has to move here, then I check, and he comes out. I can win the f7 pawn that way. So let's play this. Threaten the checkmate. He has to move his king, then I can win f7. All right, one pawn down. He can, and we're exploding his light scores. So he says, I'm going to try to go for some counterplay, which is actually quite funny because that pawn doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. I can even play a3 and then all his counterplay is gone. Poof. That's a funny move. Um, let's just, again, take advantage of light squares. We have a light square bishop. And our opponent resigns. And the reason why he resigns is because the king is forced off the bishop and now we can capture it. And we win. So the computer says zero mistakes, zero blunders, zero missed wins. So that just means we just played very well throughout this game. I think it's actually quite instructive. We went for a weakness in this position, which was the e5 pawn. We won it. And after that, we just slowly converted. Slowly attacked weaknesses, traded off pieces that we needed to, found a plan, and that's that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I know it was just one game, but it was a long game. And it was a nice game in which I explained my thoughts. And hopefully you guys learned from it as well. If you guys liked it, please like and subscribe. And please, um, next week, five, uh, 6.30 to whenever, join my Twitch channel for some more educational content. Alright, I'll see you guys later.